makes me, I want to do it. I mean, it's a good thing to do. I want to do it. And you know, everyone wants to do it. And you all have to do be quite a shot, wouldn't it? All right, everybody, let us begin. Okay, so a couple things really quick. So, chapter 23 of the review book will be due on Wednesday. So, originally, they do the 20s in two chapters, but we're coming up to spring break, so we got to crunch it down a little bit. And but World War One was such just changed everything. Wait till you see that there's three huge things that I'm going to talk about today. And so it's going to be that first two columns of the bookmark. Don't worry about the chapter numbers. Now, when I do a quiz, I will narrow it down a little bit. But they're all on there in the review book. And the 20s, you know, there's certain things we have to know. We are going to watch a great video on that. And everyone who's God will be responsible for what we do in class today. But three massive things are going to happen. Boy, do you I can't understand what a big deal World War One was. So let's go ahead then. And where do we finish in here? Do we get to the Creole Commission? We say we did. Did we not get to the Creole Commission? That was propaganda. We ended in a what? Oh, socialists and Germans, right? Yeah. All the anti-war people, and they became the enemies. And so if you were against the war, especially if you remember the Socialist Party, you would be an enemy. You're right, yeah. We do the Four Minute Man. Um, oh, who was the leader of the Bolsheviks? Yes, Vladimir Lenin. And what was the revolution? Yeah, the October Revolution, which happened in what month? November. November. And the, that became the flag of what country after they won the Civil War? Or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? And so it's going to be the Soviet Union. When I was your age, it was the Soviet Union. And yes, you might, you know, the people will call them Russia at that time. I do it because I'm just so used to saying Russia, even then. But that's not quite proper because the Soviet Union had Russians, but it also had Ukrainians and Belarusians and, and Lithuanians and Estonians and, and um, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and Georgians. So there are all kinds of different people who were not Russian. It's, it's a little bit demeaning to those people. It's like calling somebody who lives in Great Britain, calling them English. In fact, if you want to have some fun, go into a Welsh tavern and say, hey, I heard you guys are English. And then you, if you had fun there, then go up to Glasgow, Scotland and do that. And then it'll be, uh, it'll be nice knowing. Don't do that. Maybe I'll tell you my Welsh story. But we got to this. Yeah. What is it? I can't tell you. What is it? I'll tell you Are later. Are you We're the cool ones. Yeah. We're All right. So. I'll, t I'll tell you, you want to hear the story real fast? Yeah. The Welsh language is almost indecipherable to English speakers, but you know, it looks like just a bunch of consonants. It's actually really cool. Welsh language sounds really cool. But we were in this little, you know, tavern, that's a place, you know, that's, that's like a little restaurant, too. You know? So well, my wife over there, we had, uh, we got what I had about 50 times when I was in England, fish and chips. And so I got, we're eating and, uh, we're talking to people and they're talking you know, we're from, you know, they know a little about the United States. We're, it was really nice. Everybody was so nice to us. We're just having a blast. A little town called Len Dundow in Wales, in Wales. And all of a sudden these two people, a couple came in and everyone shuts up. And it was really weird. And the guy, this guy was sitting next to us. He just kind of touched him on like that. And then everybody started talking Welsh. You, they, they speak two languages, you know, they're, they're, but they saw start speaking Welsh. And they're speaking Welsh and they come up and they try to order something and they, they talk in Welsh and they, they speak back, you know, like we don't understand you, you're speaking in Welsh. And so the couple left. And then everyone started talking in English again. And like, what's the deal? You know, like, what, what happened? Oh, that was an English couple, you could tell. So we wanted them out. Huh? 
No, because yeah, it was really funny. They were so nice to us, but they didn't want the English in there. I just thought that was great. England brutally conquered Wales, you know, and that's, but it's really funny. I would have, they're really nice in England too. They're actually too nice there. And Wales, they're really nice. Scotland, they're really nice. Of course, every place I've gone, people are really nice. I, I'll even tell you my Verdun story, but I'll wait for that. Huh? Everyone in France is shockingly nice. Huh? But actually, everyone else was nice. I'm sure the mugger would have been nice. Didn't mug us. See? <laughs> All right. So we got to this. Let's go and get. Did I show you this one? Yeah. Yeah, I love this cartoon. And did I show you these? So these are some of the propaganda that try to get men to join. And think about young men that are trying to get, hey, you, you know, you don't want to embarrass yourself in front of women. And I just find this is so funny. First off, this artist really liked this model. And the, gee, I wish I were a man, I joined the Navy, implying you're not a real man. And then similar thing here, but I love, you know, if you want to fight, you know, because she's not scared, but this is my favorite one. I want you. Implying she will date you if you join the Navy. It's blatantly playing on that to the young man. I just find that hilarious. I got really, I, I, I would have had some very bad news for all the young men if they joined, thinking that would happen. She's not. You're never going to meet her. But moving on. So the thing is to hate all enemies. And I can't emphasize that enough. Once you decide that there are enemies, it's anybody against the war effort. And that includes people, not only in your own country, but the people that might be enemies. So here you can see, clearly, she is drowning. What happened? Yeah, you both, exactly right. And remember Belgium, this is 1918. And there's no disguising what they're implying is going to happen very soon there, right? And that's that's affecting propaganda. I mean, this kind of propaganda, especially this, this, this assault, is used to this very moment against enemies. And it's very effective because it's terrifying, but it's also, it appeals to kind of a, a paternalistic view that men might have, or a lot of men. So this is gonna trigger in the United States war matter. And absolutely just insanity against potential enemies. And they start looking for them. It's like, oh, why? What, you know, if there's enemies all over. If you're against the war, you must be an enemy. And it's especially focused on people with German names, recent German immigrants. There is still a massive wave of immigrants coming from Germany all the way up until the war beginning. And so they started targeting them. And remember, I mentioned there's a lot of posters about dogs. I like dogs, but not this group. One of the symbols of this war would be the num would be dachshunds that would be killed and hanging from trees. They would murder these German breeds of dogs. But not only that, they would attack people with German last names. They would throw rocks through the windows. My great grandfather uh, on my mom's side, German, last name was Schutz. And that I didn't tell you this story. I thought it was first period. Oh, I did? Uh, breaking the window yeah. oh so i did tell you that one okay and i couldn't i think i told two classes i didn't tell two classes problem with having four classes <laughs> sometimes i forget if i told one class and it didn't you know but this would happen a lot i'll tell you another story about him for the great depression now it's a pretty good story you have to wait mm -hmm. and so i uh proof you have to be an american you know the Little kids out there with the hell of the Kaiser. Yeah, and you know this four-year-old has a real hatred of the Kaiser. And this is clearly the parents doing it and indoctrinating them. And look at these German atrocities. You Lutzburgs, blood sausage. Limburger cheese, sauerkraut. In fact, sauerkraut was becoming very popular. And so people started changing the name of sauerkraut. Anybody know what they started calling sauerkraut? Yeah, Liberty Cabbage. How about Dachshunds became Liberty Pups? How about hamburgers? Hamburgers is a German name. Good guess. Salisbury steak. What? Yeah, Salisbury is a city in, in England. Salisbury steak, just a ground beef patty. Uh, Frankfurters became hot dogs. Yeah, and that's you know that's kind of the humorous um, war madness. But to target people 
of German names, target people of German ancestry, like they're not loyal to the country. That's kind of a terrifying first step towards something, isn't it? It's not that they did anything. They had a German name. I should add, a lot of Irish Americans were attacked for the same reason, because Ireland was trying to win their independence from Britain, and they just had an attempted revolution in 1916 that failed in Britain, or in, in Ireland, called the Easter Rebellion. And the British executed uh, 40 revolutionaries. And they tried to enlist German help because they wanted to get rid of Britain. So Irish might not be real Americans too. And this spread all throughout the United States. Think about it for a second. Targeting somebody for their ethnic background, for their name, for who they are, and nothing they did, isn't this kind of the first step towards something absolutely terrifying in total war? How far is it from that from targeting them, breaking their windows, to soon running them out of their homes, burning their homes down, perhaps concentrating them in areas and putting them on trains and taking them places? Isn't that exactly what happened in the Ottoman Empire? What is that called again? It's the first step towards genocide, and it's terrifying. In World War II, we took even a bigger step towards genocide. Not all the way, but we did ethnic cleansing. Who did the United States put into concentration camps? Not because of anything they did. They're Japanese Americans. Only on the West Coast. It's only on the West Coast, but that's where the majority of immigrants from Japan lived. And they lost everything they had, and they were put in concentration camps. Ironically, young men in those camps would still be drafted into the United States Army. Isn't so that just wild? You're not trustworthy to have your home and you lose your farm. But, yeah, you could be fodder for a machine gun. So, this has happened a number of times. And so, you get the, the point about this is it doesn't necessarily take people, or it doesn't take the law. You get people so geared up, you just get individuals or take the, taking the law in their hands, AKA vigilantes. And they had all these liberty societies formed to try to run down anti-American feeling. A bunch in Montana to run down and just beat and harass and intimidate. Who'd want to speak out if you might get beaten up? And so this happened in future wars. For example, right after Ukraine was invaded by Russia, you had all these people said, I hate Russia, and here's a guy who owned a liquor store dumping out Smirnoff's vodka. What? I know, and like, what? That's gonna stop the Russian war effort? We're gonna get rid of Russian mustard. What? That's just a name. But the most extreme I can think of happened in 2003, when the United States was trying to drum up support to invade Iraq claiming that they had weapons of mass destruction, which they didn't, and that they were involved in the September 11th attack, France, one of our closest allies, was completely opposed and said, we don't think they have weapons, and it would turn into a disastrous civil war. And they wouldn't join our attack. And there was all this anti-French feeling all over the United States. For example, the state of Montana divested from French-owned corporations like Michelin or Airbus, because you know, we have our like, pension funds in that, we would lose something like $60 million because of that. We'll show the French. They were allies, but they wouldn't go to war. So this was, so the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, George W. Bush was president, a Republican. The House was controlled by Republicans. And they voted to change the menu in the House cafeteria. So you can see in this little picture right here, they got rid of French fries and changed it to freedom fries. <laughs> And they got rid of French toast in the breakfast menu and changed it to freedom toast. That's war madness. That's kind of crazy. I know it's all kind of humorous in a way, but it's also kind of scary. So, especially when the French turn out to be pretty much exactly 100% correct. So, the socialists, though, became the biggest target within the United States. Because socialists believe that it was kill, workers kill, killing workers while the, while the capitalist gets rich. Remember, they're anti-capitalist in a lot of ways. One of the most prominent labor unions in the United States, kind of a successor to the Knights of Labor, were the International Workers of the World, so everyone just called the IWW, or everybody called them the Wallens. Their symbol was Sabocat, right here, and one big union. 
all workers together. Here's a cartoon of basically like a, a plant where the workers are sowing the seeds of destruction and yet they'll pull out profits for the capitalists. To me, that, that cartoon's a little not backwards, but it was 1918, who knows? But they were very much against the war. So here's a cartoon against the international workers of the world. And you can imagine who funded a lot of these attacks. Companies. They hated it. the labor union. Here's the Kaiser for the international workers of the world. Well, the Wadleys were really big in a number of towns, especially towns that had brutal labor fights. Let me give you an example of a town. Let me see if this sounds familiar. You might have heard of this place. Butte. The Wadleys were huge in Butte. And Butte was booming. Copper, necessary for the war. Anybody know how big Butte was in 1917? About 110,000 people. And I put down Butte America because the people in Butte love that. And I like Butte. It's, now, it's my favorite ghost town. It, it is a ghost town. You know, it's a third the size of its peak in 1920. But Frank Little was an IWW organizer. He gave a speech against the draft in the war, saying we never should have gotten this war. It was a war to get banks rich. And there's definitely that part of the reason. Here is Frank Little right here. He was a tough, hard nosed old labor or a miner. But he spoke there, had over 10,000 people come see him speak. But these liberty associations, liberty as in you have the liberty to follow exactly what we say about the war, they went and they started threatening him. And they threatened by putting this out here to anyone who spoke and others take notice, this is a warning, it's a 3777. Anyone know what that refers to? Say hmm? again. Yeah, no one knows exactly where it started from, but everyone knew what it meant then, what, it refers to, what they were referring to. The story was that that would be used by the vigilantes in 1864, 1865 in Montana. And those were the dimensions of the threat. And so, when they put that out there, everybody knew what that meant. Now, we're not sure about the which is exactly right. And the vigilantes were these pro-Confederate thugs in, Mon in territorial Montana. And they're a bunch of Confederates, and they threatened basically people who were union men. Yes, there are a few that were actually some robbery and highwaymen, but they were actually robbers too. But they threatened to kill him. And so after his speech, he went back to his hotel room, and members of the Liberty League and the police who were involved were members. Pulled him out of his room, beat him nearly senseless, senseless tied him by his legs to the back of a car, and drug him through Butte, killing him. They lynched him. And then they hung him from this railway trestle in Butte. So he was tortured to death, lynched, for being against the war. And this would become one of the most, most famous examples of vigilante violence against those who wanted peace. And in Butte, right there in Butte. And it showed the bitter divide over this war. And nobody was arrested for this. Nobody. So any of you want to volunteer if you're against the war? Want to, anybody want to speak now? Who's next? Volunteers. We're looking for volunteers. Anyone? Some of you might, but boy, you're going to have to have a heck of a lot of guns to be determined. And most people, if they have families, they realize they can't do that. And this shuts people up. That's how terror works. This is pretty scary to happen in Montana. I should add that Montana Highway Patrolmen have that on their uniform. And 3777. It's amazing how the glamorization of, of pro Confederate thugs in Montana was. You know, people only know half the history. Heck, there might even be a parade about this. We were literally just talking about the vigilante parade today, going through a few things. These were not nicknamed. At least we, that's not our school nickname. Yeah. When Third, May third. So one of the few times it's not on the same day as the AP exam. So a number of people were arrested. Montana had their own. Montana had their own. Uh, espionage Act, and these three were arrested. She was arrested for complaining about the price of food. Because remember, I told you there's 100% inflation. He was arrested. You have to just read what that was his charge. The Historical Society did a great thing on America or Montana's Espionage Act. 
Now look at the steps for saying that. Four to ten years. He would be pardoned by the gover governor after two and a half years in 1921. But that gave you an idea how just absolutely repressive. Imagine going to prison because you complained because the price of food was going. That's how repressive it was. Remember when I told you about how do you start a totalitarian state? You get people scared, get them all geared up, looking for the enemy, and you can pass a law like the espionage act. You can, see? And it's still on the books. So, Schenck versus the United States would be a court case that would go all the way to the Supreme Court in 1918, I didn't put the date down, 1918, about the espionage act. Schenck was a socialist protesting the draft. And this was right outside the White House. Women demanding suffrage were taking the fight to Wilson, who promised it. And they were talking about the Espionage Act. They were arresting women demanding the right to vote under the Espionage Act. Now, you read, read the key parts of the law. It was supposedly about the war. But now they're just shutting up political, or they're make, uh, shutting up people with different political views. So Schiff went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled speech can be limited if it, if it is a clear and present danger. So what amendment says Congress can pass no law that will breach the freedom of speech? What amendment? And if you did not know immediately that that was the First Amendment, you better write that down now. That is not just something we need to know for a test. That's something you need to know to be what's called a citizen of the United States. The First Amendment. Hey, I know you forget things. Things get muddled up in your mind, but that's what you really got to know. I empathize with things getting muddled up. I'm old. Everything's muddled up. But the First Amendment. But it doesn't say you have a blanket freedom of speech. If it provides a clear and present danger, the example used in the court decision was, you cannot walk into a theater, a crowded theater, and yell fire because you think it would be fun to watch the pan. That provides a clear and present danger. So you do not have blanket freedom of speech. Now, that's a pretty logical argument, isn't it? Isn't it? But who decides what clear and present danger is? Who carries out the laws? the executive branch. Isn't that almost unlimited power? And there's, don't forget, the Espionage Act is on the books. In fact, there was this Yahoo moron, I mean, really, who was trying to impress his uh, weird peop, weird friends, Air National Guardsman, who was printing national, national secrets on, what is it, Discord? Discord? Is that a, yeah. is that a gaming thing? Is that, I, I know there's other stuff on there, but that they're playing like video games together, and he's putting up national secrets to impress his gaming buddies. And he just is being sentenced under the espionage act right now. Now let's be clear about it though. That guy should be taken out of office. That's far too dumb. Hey guys, look how cool I am. And finally somebody realized, hey, wait a second, those are top secret papers he's putting out. So, most famous person arrested then under this would be, and everyone write this down, See this man right there? That's Eugene Debs. So write down Eugene Debs, the head of the Socialist Party, was arrested and sentenced to 10 years for going against the war. He would not back down. And so in 1920, he would run for, pre for president from a prison cell. There's no, nothing that says in the Constitution that you cannot be a prisoner. So he was in a federal prison in Atlanta. Those are some, there are about three different versions of the button with him for president convict number 9655. And that is a button I wish I had. If I found one, those are really rare, but I would wear that. And part of the reason I wear that because no one would have any idea probably what it means. And so I'd have a lot of fun with that. Except for that, in the, in the two people who would know, we'd become fast friends. Okay, so, yeah, he got a million votes from a prison cell, a million votes. And so anybody believes that you could be arrested and be convicted of a felon and can't run for president, you're completely wrong. Of course you can. And 
I mean, there's a very good shot that President Trump will be a felon under New York law in, a, in, a, in the month the trial is going to begin. And very good chance. And of course he could still run. He will not be in prison. He'll probably have to pay a fine and go on parole. He, he paid off an adult film star that he paid off to have an affair with her to keep her silent during the 2020 election. He violated about three, three uh, um, felony statutes. And he did it, everyone knows. It. So if they find him guilty, which I've got to add one more thing. 20 years ago, if you had an affair, your political career, career was done. Now it's just like, oh, yeah, of course. Former president had, had an affair with an adult film star. Why wouldn't he? So moving on. Jump right to this. It's just weird how things happen. It just blows me away. One of his 91, like three of his 91 investments. I don't know. It's Riyadh. I am, my mind still hasn't wrapped around this in the political time. Women had joined the, the workforce in vast numbers, not like World War II, but they were taking what were called man's jobs. And, okay, 20% of all women had to work, their families needed the money. And they worked on jobs that were lower skilled, therefore there's a larger pool of workers and they had lower pay. But now they're taking jobs with a little more skill, like this one, a very technical, hard job, riveting. That's really hard to do. And really precise skill. Eventually better qualities of welding will kind of replace that, but still, big jobs. And so the big thing is for this for women, if they're taking jobs that men could do and doing them quite well, just as good or better, like anybody else, you know, they quality weight laborers, they still are not considered full citizens. They don't have the right to vote in most or about half the states by then. And that is going to help fuel the suffrage movement. Wilson promised to fight for suffrage back in 1912 and did almost nothing. And then when the war hit, he said, nah, we got to wait till the war is over. And this has been a cry for women or anybody who did not have rights. Be patient sometime down the road. Of course, it's always easy for someone to say, be patient if they already have those rights. I mean, you get elements of that already now. When adults will tell you, be patient, and when you're an adult, you can do these things. Doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, there's elements, you know, but still, it's annoying. And so here, you have sympathy for Germans. What about us? And they protested, and they were direct protests. They went outside the White House 24 hours a day. They embarrassed President Wilson. Now that one you have to get, they embarrassed Wilson. I don't type that down, they embarrassed him. Direct action works. It embarrasses people who want to act like they're fighting a noble cause. And this happens to this day. It's embarrassing. And it's happening um, right now to, for example, to President Biden because of his uh, support of Israel, what they're doing in Gaza. They've curtailed his public appearances because protesters, and it's hurt him in the polls. He's embarrassed. He's prob that's how direct action happens. So, Alice Paul, that's her right there and there. That's her in prison. She would organize women to do this. The National Women's Suffrage Movement. Just know Alice Paul. Amazing person. Uh, very young, probably. Mid 20s. Uh, very smart, hard to find anybody more with more courage than Alice Paul. And her thought was, we are going to make you act and we will not quit until you change your policy. And they pressured Wilson. And what's the first thing Wilson did? Have them all arrested, as you can see there, under the Espionage Act. And so they became political prisoners. And here, right outside, this is right outside the federal court in Washington, D.C., about women who are arrested for demanding the right to vote under the Espionage Act, which that statement right there, she very well could be arrested too. That's courage. And within prison, Alice Paul and others copying the, what the, the British suffragettes as they were known were doing, they began a hunger strike. So that's a picture of what happened. That's four feet. And there's a reason they force feed, and it's not to save their lives because we're having a hunger strike. It's torture. They think it's steel pipe. Steel pipe about a quarter inch or about a half an inch thick, and it's curved at the end. So it's steel. And they would jam it down their nose, and it would break apart their sinuses, 
break apart, scratch. I mean, you can imagine, just rip apart your nose. And jam it in because your nose is connected. And it's all kind of connected in there. And then they would dump this kind of rice gruel thing down their throat. And it kind of felt like they were drowning. And I guess the pain is beyond comprehension. It was torture. Force feeding is torture. Now, I'm not saying you want people to die, but that's not what they're doing. They're telling the other women, you want to keep your hunger strike going, which is embarrassing us? You're embarrassing us. That's nice. So that happened in the United States, force feeding. Yeah, force feeding, just, it, it, it's, it's a really horrific torture. And eventually, going through that hell, it worked. Wilson finally had to act along with other Democrats and progressive Republicans and progressive Democrats had to push for what's going to become the 19th Amendment. It's known today as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. This was all wartime measure. Remember when I told you a lot of stuff happened in the war? It's kind of a big deal. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment. And this is Alice Paul sewing a star on a flag they made for each star that wrapped for each state that ratified it. So two thirds of the House and the Senate, uh, conservative uh, Republicans and conservative Democrats voted against it. But it got to two thirds of the House and the Senate. Wilson signed it, but then it needs three quarters of the states, which is a lot of states. The last state assembly to ratify it was Tennessee. And when Tennessee ratified it in early 1920, that is when women would be guaranteed the right. Or let me rephrase that. Women cannot be denied the right to vote because they Laws are complex. Kind of a big deal. So that's um, obviously kind of posing for them. But the vote, you would have each ballot has a thing, the registration number on it, and then the ballot. So you rip it off, and you put the ballot in here, and then the registration number. And if you don't have a matching, they don't count the votes. That's a way to assure voter safety. They do the same thing like mail-in ballots. If the numbers don't match, they, you don't count the votes. So they, that, that's the way it keeps holding the even back then through today. So prohibition was a wartime measure. So the temperate food had been grown. We talked about this before. But then it became they're wasting grain. And Germans were associated with, at that time, the most popular type of beer, lager beer. It's a different way to brew it, whatever. But here, the Hun Booze Association, and shows a bunch of bottles, and we waste grain. And that was the argument. Grain that could be going for the troops is going to make beer. It's going to make whiskey. You know, and same thing with the corn, the rice, everything they make alcohol out of. And we waste it. So that became the argument, a wartime measure. We have to cut back on alcoholic beverages to save for the war. Did it save for the war? Not really. But that was the argument. And you can imagine those who wanted temperance, especially a lot of these progressive Republicans and Democrats, began pushing for this. And there were a number of states, including here's one uh, where vote in Ohio. Vote yes on prohibition in Ohio. And states start to prohibit like hard alcohol, you know, eventually down, you know, all the way through Montana, put a prohibition on alcohol in 1919. And that would lead to the 18th Amendment, the grand experiment to ban alcohol. Now, how do you enforce it? Congress passed a law called the Volstead Act. These are all wartime measures, the Volstead Act. And the Volstead Act was the federal enforcement. There was going to be state enforcement, which was banned. But federal enforcement, how did the federal government enforce laws? They can tax. So they put a 1,000% tax on the sale of alcohol. So let's say you sell $1 worth of alcohol, you're a, whatever, a vendor, whatever it might be. You have to pay a $10 tax. How long will you stay in business? So you ban, that's how they ban it. So the, so the government agents that would go out, the government men, that would go out and look for those who are trying to sell alcohol legally. Have you ever heard of the, of the term bootlegging? That's selling alcohol illegally. They were treasury agents. Because you, 
Department of Treasury because they collected the taxes. Government men from the Treasury agents. Government men. G-men. And that's what they would out of this. Those agents would eventually become part of the Justice Department. You might have heard of them called the FBI. And that would all come out of prohibition. And their nickname would be G-men. And that comes from prohibition. Next, the Spanish flu. A worldwide pandemic. Not two big waves in 1918, one big wave in 1919 would kill over 675,000 Americans. Over 50 million people worldwide died. There's estimates as high as 100 million died of this flu. And just 25 or 35 years earlier, there was the Russian flu, which killed about a quarter of that number. And so this was another big pandemic. And you can imagine because of the war, this is why it was so deadly. Two reasons it was so deadly. First off, 15 to 35 year olds, that age group were the most vulnerable. And that's unusual. Their immune systems, you're younger, they react faster. It would put the victims in a state of shock, those who were infected, and that shock would kill them. Older people are very young, they might they have a better chance. They might get really sick. And especially when the disease is brand new, where people have immunities, it gives you, you know, they would have like a brain fog, uh, they would lose their vision, lose their sense of smell, sight. Does that sound familiar? These brand new diseases, we have no immunities yet. So it causes all these things. Um, sometimes it would last a really long time. They'd feel really sick. Once again, does that sound familiar? And uh, that would really affect soldiers. And these are some of the things the Philadelphia Naval Yard, they weren't really sure if it was spread by aerosol or from spit, so don't spit. They knew about masks for about 40 years, what's incredibly effective. If both people are wearing a mask, especially to stop disease that is airborne. So states all over have this is from the Red Cross, but they put mask band-aids on all over the United States, 1918, 1919. And I like advertisers start saying you could buy products like Orlick's malted milk to solve or to cure you. But doesn't this look like this is um, Orlick's malted milk with influenza? Hey, you can buy your influenza here. <laughs> Doesn't it look how it look like they're advertising that? And where did the Spanish flu begin? Kansas. Almost certainly in one of those new camps created to train all the new volunteers, which they uncomfortably called the camps to train, in, not volunteers, I'm sorry, the new draftees in the US Army. They called those camps concentration camps. In World War II, they called them boot camps. So hear about basic training, I, I think of basic training, I think boot camp. But this is how, you can see this picture right here, I gotta click it. This shows where it spread, the first big cases, you know, it started in Kansas and along the coast and quickly spread throughout the country. Why did it start on the coast? It started in Kansas and then it got on train, these soldiers and went to Philadelphia and New York to be shipped out and boom, spread. And that's a mass grave in Philadelphia. And that's mask in San Francisco. And this was horrific. But it was a little bit different style of virus. And so it had waves. It wasn't like COVID that would spread throughout. And COVID, fortunately, even though it was very deadly, was not near as deadly as this, thankfully. But here, like we had mask mandates and people went, went nuts and protested that inconvenience of having to wear a mask, which I didn't like either, so don't get me wrong. But same thing happened in 1919, 1918, 1919. Anti-mask league organized in San Francisco. So when you talk about, it, you know, people think about what happened during COVID. Oh yeah, we've gone through this before. One more thing I'll say about the Spanish, or two more things about the Spanish flu. First off, I always wondered for years, Nobody wanted to talk about it. It was always like, oh, we had this pandemic and then it ended. And nobody talked about it. And, and look at um, newspaper reports, et cetera, in the early 1920s on, they never talked about it. They never mentioned it. And I wondered why didn't people mention it? This is kind of a big deal. It arguably stopped the German offensive in 1918 and saved the allies to win the war. Why don't they talk about it? And then we had our own. And I realized something. 
It drove people crazy. We went nuts as a society. And then it's kind of embarrassing. And nobody wants to talk about how bad it was. And we drive it out of our memory. And if you don't believe me, don't you drive it out of your memory? Do you remember how awful it was? Those first couple of weeks when we had to go home or we were isolated and had no idea how bad it could have been. We had no idea. And then how bad that hybrid year was. Do you remember that? People forgot. And that's what happened. Then. And some people it was harder than others. Oh, the other thing is this. Why they call it Spanish flu? This is the last thing you have to get. They censored it. Every country at war did not want the, the people to know how bad it was. So they kept it out of the newspapers. They ordered the newspapers not to report it, or they would have been arrested in the United States under what law? Espionage Act. So nobody knew about it. But then it hit Spain that was neutral. And that hit the international lines so they couldn't keep it secret anymore. And since it went to the first place that most people heard about it, even though people were dying, they heard about it in Spain. So it became the Spanish flu, which is actually kind of a really bad thing. Spain had nothing to do with this, and it applies somehow like the Spanish did this. This might shock you, but viruses are rarely nationalistic. Yeah, virus actually don't trust them. They don't care where you're from. So last couple of things then. Wilson in January of 1918, just as the Spanish flu was beginning. Oh, the Spanish flu is now just kind of rolled into one of the many flus that go around. The Russian flu, which is very close to COVID back in 1890s, that's now the common cold. So my guess is COVID, uh, we get more immunity, so it becomes less even you know, just more of a just a nasty illness. They're probably just another cold. So let's get back to this. Wilson wanted to make the war into something for a greater cause. Remember, uh, make the world safer democracy. Wilson came up with this idea of this ide idealized peace. Now, do not write these down. Do not do not write these down. There are 14 points he made with the idea being after the war, this idealized will make a better world. The thing is, they were pushing. This horrible catastrophe has got to be worth something. And that's part of Lincoln's argument for the Emancipation Proclamation. This catastrophe for coming for this country has got to be for a greater good. It's a new birth of freedom. Here, we will make a better world and never have it again. And so people didn't really know what Wilson said, but it became to represent. Wilson came to represent something worth it. These are the main things we do have to get. Arms reduction, to do something to limit the arms race. And they did try a little bit after the war. Open diplomacy, transparency, no more secret agreements, no more secret uh, deals being made, like those deals made to Italy to get them in the war. Self-determination, that was letting people decide their own fate. They even specifically mentioned, like, Pope. Which is ironic because that Poland would also be the, the issue that start World War II. And to solve problems before war happens, the League of Nations. And this idea, arms reduction, open diplomacy, self-determination, put a little like a top, you know, something here and write down, this would be the essence after the war. This would be known as liberal diplomacy. We will come together as nations, even people, countries you don't like, and try to solve the issue before there's war. But, but you gotta get two more things. I know, I know, two more things. I know, Aaron, I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? Yes. Thank you. I told you a story, remember? So, this was symbolic. Nobody knew what the heck were in the 14 points. Yes, I did have to list them out in the class one time, but why? But it became a symbol. Just like, remember I told you about the square deal? Or other slogans, it became a slogan for peace and Wilson came to represent that. What's gonna happen if we don't get that peace? And his allies immediately said, no. Wilson has no idea. Do you really think we're gonna do all this? We want revenge for what Germany did, especially in the colonies. Freedom of the colonies, self-determination. They were going to do that. 
Britain had to use up their gold reserve. They're going to squeeze every penny out of South Africa or India. Central Asia or Central Europe? That's a hodgepodge of people. How are you going to figure out what the heck countries are going to be? Neither, and what about the United States? Are you going to allow people who can't vote vote? At that time, he still was fighting women's suffering. Now you can put it up. One more thing. No, I'm kidding. Hey, I'm always going to have moments. Like that. You're supposed to appreciate that. Don't you appreciate that? Just, just nod. I could just be, hey, learn. Hmm? OK, we'll do, well. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna bookmark. Why is it so much? I do like it. I 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 like now, is it that feel better now? Yes. yes. How was that, Hollis? It was in my face. And it was really fun to sit in my favorite desk ever, this desk right here. Why is that your favorite desk? No, no one doesn't ever manufacture like this desk. Well, now that one I believe. <laughs> yeah, that one I believe. Yeah. Really? First time, actually. Wow. Your grandfather's? Yeah. Wow. Did he gouge those pieces up right there? No, that was me. Oh, good, good, yeah. You want to claim? I don't blame him. Made it in backyard shop. Forge the steel. It's pretty special. We have a connection. What is it? There's like a chapter there, right? That's Rolling Stones. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it a Rolling Stones sticker? Yeah, I think so. With the Union Jack in the background. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I think it's been on there for probably 20 years. No, probably 30 years. Yeah, actually, I saw my grandfather put that there. He's like a big rolling. 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 Oh, we got to get the cameras off. Yeah. One day, I'm going to have that um, trench cake just because. You're going to make it anyways? Yeah, I'm going to make it anyway. Oh, we'll see. Maybe you'll get something. Uh, you know, I just want to make it.